I just started the recording of this open meeting and uh, in compliance with CMS. For the record, prior to doing so, I announced that Palmetto GBA would make an audio recording of the open meeting and consented on behalf of Palmetto GBA. So once again, I want to welcome everyone to this afternoon's uh, meeting. We have one presentation this afternoon addressing the proposed LCD treatment of varicose veins of the lower extremity. 15 minutes for your presentation. Um, I'll give you a two-minute warning if, if time is, is running out. If we have any extra time left during this 15-minute time block, we uh, can take questions. As I mentioned uh, at the previous meeting, we really do appreciate everyone being a part of this meeting today. This is an important part of the local coverage determination process. Uh, given that it's a way for stakeholders to provide us here at Palmetto GBA with feedback and any comments or concerns that they may have regarding our proposed uh, LCDs. Obviously, the, the ultimate goal here is to make the best possible coverage uh, decisions for our beneficiaries. So with all that said, Dr. Doherty, I'll let you introduce where you're from, and you can begin your presentation. Thank you. I'm Stephen Doherty. I'm a surgeon from Clarksville, Tennessee. I am um, the chairman of healthcare policy and advocacy for the American Vein and Lymphatic Society. I've served on a care advisory committee in Tennessee under three Medicare administrative contractors for the last 25 years. So I'm representing the AVLS. Uh, we are working closely with the American Venus Forum, the other major vein society in the country, and we very likely will submit joint comments in our written comments on Friday. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you all uh, about something we think is, is very important. Conservative management is a critical part of managing these patients, but there's no evidence that conservative care will prevent the need for treatment of the conditions that are covered under the policies. Compression might be useful for selective trial to discriminate ambiguous lower extremity symptoms. Some patients only need conservative care. Others need significant treatment, and compression is an adjunct for care of many of those patients. Compression also may be used to treat edema, lymphedema, pain, management of venous thrombosis, and some postoperative patients. Graduated compression stockings are one option, and you list that in your policy, but you don't mention inelastic compression or compression wrapping, which may be more appropriate for some patients. Some patients just cannot tolerate compression because of anatomic characteristics, arthritis, shoulder, back pain, obesity, neurologic disease, or some kind of disability which limits their ability to actually don and wear the devices. A two to four week trial of weight loss as a condition of treatment just isn't realistic. While weight loss for many of our patients is ideal and we encourage it, a two to four week trial is just not going to mean anything in terms of weight loss for these patients. A prescribed exercise plan is useful, but it's not feasible for a lot of patients and it's difficult to document. Periodic elevation is not possible for some patients, especially those with severe cardiac or respiratory disease. The key thing is that the ability to manage those elements of conservative care varies so much from patient to patient that rigid rules as a prerequisite for vein treatment just aren't reasonable. We think that the LCD language should encourage those elements of conservative care to be individualized to the patient, but the LCD needs to be clear that these are things that are useful for some patients and that these are not things that should be used to deny care on the part of the LCD or a future auditor. Sclerotherapy is the only necessary treatment for some venous insufficiency and it's adjunctive after other treatment of some veins. It's the only useful technique and the preferred technique for treatment of many abnormal extremity veins. Liquid sclerotherapy has been around a very long time. It's generally appropriate for veins no larger than three millimeters in diameter with modern care, but there's some physicians who use it for larger veins, typically up to about six millimeters in diameter, and it does work, but the problem is that the larger the vein, the more the liquid is diluted by the blood and the less effective it is. So foam sclerotherapy has been around for about 25 years. It's a much better option than liquid for veins, typically over about three millimeters in diameter, and it's considered by many to be appropriate for veins two millimeters in diameter or larger. 
ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy is a critical part of much of what we do. It allows us to treat veins that are too deep to see through the skin. It allows visualization of the movement of foam into the target veins. And with imaging to see the foam, we can utilize uh, manipulation techniques to limit the foam passing into non-target veins and perforating veins. So that's important to get the results and for safety. There's no actual CPT code that covers ultrasound-guided foam sclerotherapy. Uh, the three codes that I list under uh, pre-procedure mapping, the target, non-target, perforated, and deep veins, the ultrasound guidance for needle placement and injection of the veins describe some of the work involved, and that's all we have right now until CPT actually writes a code that is accurate and, and describes all the work involved in ultrasound-guided foam. Well, foam sclerotherapy may be physician compounded, which we call PCF. It is made at the bedside with a detergent, sclerosin, and a gas, which may be room air, carbon dioxide, oxygen, or mixture. And it can be used in nearly any vein or venous malformation. Non-compounded foam is a term that was developed for proprietary foam. Verathena, the proprietary foam, was FDA approved in 2014 for use in the great saphenous and the accessory saphenous veins and in varicose saphenous tributaries. CPT 36465 and 466 describe use of Verathena in the trunkal veins only. And CPT refers to codes that are just simple uh, sclerosin injection if varathena is used in other varicose veins, which makes it not useful for varicose veins uh, from an economic standpoint because the drug is more expensive than the procedure actually pays. Vein diameters get some discussion. The definition of a varicose vein is somewhat arbitrary, three millimeters in diameter with an abnormal wall and valve function. It's not really feasible to uh, expect to do Doppler exam on every varicose vein, and it's administratively difficult to distinguish between necessary treatment and cosmetic treatment for veins less than three millimeters in diameter. So commonly, veins under three millimeters in diameter are not covered for sclerotherapy. What we suggest is liquid sclerotherapy be covered for veins three to six millimeters in diameter, foam sclerotherapy for veins three millimeters or larger in diameter, and that either foam or liquid uh, be covered for veins less than three millimeters in diameter if there's spontaneous or traumatic hemorrhage or where there are bulging uh, veins with thinning of the skin threatening hemorrhage in the elderly. Additionally, non-compounded foam uh, should be covered for treatment of the great saphenous, anterior accessory great saphenous, posterior accessory great saphenous, and intersaphenous veins, uh, all of which are FDA-approved indications that are well accepted Saphenous vein ablation is typically done with radiofrequency or laser to heat the vein to seal it shut with tumescent anesthesia or local anesthesia around the vein. Cyanoacrylate glue is utilized to treat the saphenous vein. Mechanochemical ablation is used to treat the saphenous vein, and you all cover these appropriately so. Non-compounded foam is covered under your policy. One question is whether you want to cover it for treatment of the small saphenous vein, which is not approved under the FDA approval. It works, but it's not FDA approved in that utilization, so that's a question that needs to be resolved. Uh, we think it's reasonable to cover it. Physician compounded foam does not have FDA approval because there's no financial incentive for a company to make the expenditure to get FDA approval for it, though it's the standard of care for many varicose veins, and it is an accepted alternative for treatment of saphenous veins. Perforating veins are described in Section 3 of your LCD, and you say to cover treatment of veins uh, near a, an active venous ulcer after three months of failure of compression therapy. That is really old uh, in the way of recommendation. There is a randomized controlled trial published in 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine, which showed very clearly that treating the venous insufficiency does speed up ulcer healing. The same kind of treatment should be applied for a healed ulcer, which is C5 disease. These patients simply heal faster if you treat the venous insufficiency. That's the underlying cause. Uh, recommendations come from uh, several sources. One of the important ones is the Welch paper, which was published this past summer in the Journal of Vascular Surgery, Venous and Lymphatic Disorders, which comes from the American Venous Forum and the AVLS. 
and it suggests covering treatment for patients who have incompetent perforating veins, which are an important source of reflux and the symptomatic reflux in veins, or if there's local pain or tenderness, which is not resolved after treatment of other regional venous incompetence. So we think those are important. Diagnostic venous ultrasound is not referenced in your proposed LCD, and we think it should be. It's essential to be able to treat these patients in the first place to get a good diagnostic ultrasound study. These are some of the more common indications for such a study. Imaging at the time of the procedure should be described. The codes 93971 for mapping for uh, physician compounded foam sclerotherapy is an essential part of the procedure. 76942 for ultrasound guidance to inject the sclerosant uh, is essential. To place the needle for the injection is essential. But ultrasound guidance and mapping are included in saphenosphene ablations with non-compounded foam, thermal ablation, mocha, and cyanacrylate closure, and it's useful for that to be referenced in your LCD. Finally, follow-up exams are limited exams done typically three to seven days after ablation of a truncal vein to assure the vein is occluded and there's no deep vein thrombosis. It's not clear how soon that should be. The Welch paper does not put a timeline on that. It just says uh, follow-up uh, whenever necessary. There's no agreement about other follow-up exams, but we think a diagnostic exam after defined course of treatment, which is often several treatments, is valuable if there are residual or recurrent symptoms. Limitations are problematic. You say you don't cover if the patient cannot tolerate compressive dressings or stockings. Well, some people just can't no matter how hard you try. Some people have uh, these problems which make it impossible for, the, for them to don the stockings, to get them off. Same is true of the other compression devices, and some just have enough discomfort it's a problem. You don't want to cover if there's obliteration of the deep vein system or acute DVT. We agree with limitation for acute deep vein thrombosis, but there are specific reasons for treating uh, acute superficial venous thrombosis to prevent embolization of large saphenous vein thrombus. Additionally, patients may have chronic postphlebitic deep vein obstructive changes, which are best treated uh, when they have venous insufficiency that's complicating their venous hypertension. But the key is to be sure that the collateral deep vein outflow is developed for treatment. You don't want to cover treatment of clippal trinone syndrome. I understand if it's purely cosmetic, but there's evidence, uh, including a randomized controlled trial, demonstrating the value of foam sclerosis for these patients who have significant venous malformations. And foam is much less morbid than absolute alcohol injections or extensive surgery to treat these patients. It's inexpensive, and it makes a big difference for patients who have pain and tenderness or reflux through these venous malformations on down the leg, causing problems more distally. Finally, you want any interventional treatment to use equipment that is FDA approved, and that's fine. It's important, and many of our colleagues have commented on this, that ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy is not FDA approved. The foam is not FDA approved, and yet uh, this is a standard of care for treating many kinds of venous insufficiency, and it's important that this language about equipment not be confused with ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy. Medicare would not expect is language that's problematic to us. We worry about an audit nightmare someday, several years down the road. Uh, what about three sessions per leg for sclerotherapy? Does that mean per year, per life, per episode of care? I've asked that question several times of Palmetto medical directors over the last three years, and I haven't gotten an answer yet about what that means. These phrases need to be specific enough that everyone understands what they mean now for you, for us, and for rack alters down the line. Finally, if there is a reason to do more than three sessions of sclerotherapy for whatever time frame you specify, we need to be able to document somehow reasons for additional treatments for these patients since we don't have a means of getting prior authorization. Thank you for the opportunity to talk with you. Uh, be happy to answer any questions I can. We will be providing significant references, the most important of which are the CAR-T paper on ultrasound-guided foam slap therapy uh, published this year, the Welsh paper published this year regarding medical policy. Uh, these are Journal of Vascular Surgery, Venus, and Lymphatic Disorders. And it's important to bring up the Novitas policy, which was published in November of last year. 
That's a very well-written policy. We were involved in development of that policy. We can live with it. The key difference between it and what I've described to you is simply that patients with C2 and 3 disease in a venous clinical severity score less than 6 do compression for 2 to 4 weeks, and those the C4 through C6 disease are not required to do the compression. We can live with that, although there actually is no evidence that uh, the compression trial is of uh, real value for these patients. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dory. That's an excellent presentation. A lot of uh, a lot of information in there. A lot of a lot of comments, which we 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 certainly do appreciate, and um, and and we'll look through. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Doherty? I do, Dr. Doherty. This is um, Dr. Maria Linez. I appreciate listening to your presentation. I agree with Dr. Stroud. It was excellent. May I ask you a question, and since this is your area of expertise, on sure. your slide 11, sir, you talk about more than three sessions per leg, per year, per life, per episode of care. As a yes. clinician and as an expert in this field, how would you define that if you were writing this? I would say per episode of care, when you evaluate a patient clinically and with ultrasound, you come up with a plan for treatment for the things that you know will make the most difference that you can accomplish usually at a few months. That may be one treatment in one leg. It may be four or five in one leg if they have very extensive disease. But at some point, decide how far you're going to go and then stop and reassess. Some payers will say we'll allow three or four procedures per leg and then you have to have a, a period of observation and then uh, for those that do predeterminations then ask for pre-approval again to treat additional veins. Now that commonly is sclerotherapy for those additional procedures and that's not unreasonable to require one to uh, to map out a plan of care over a period of several months and then do a reassessment after that care has been delivered and then justify in the record what additional might be necessary if there is anything that's still necessary. So I would really like to see something developed where we at least have a way to justify and where we know we have a way to justify what we're doing. I realize that you won't be doing pre-approval but if we have in the LCD some mechanism that if we follow will allow us some presumption that we're being responsible about how we're treating the patient and some reasonable expectation that if we document, again, the appropriate indications for treating additionally that we will not be drawn and quartered in an audit three years down the line. Thanks. I'd like to treat people who need it, but I also like not to worry about what I'm going to be liable for years down the line. Sure. Thank you. Appreciate your comments, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm no, hearing none. Dr. Doherty, thank you again for uh, taking your time, the time out of your day to talk to us. Uh, again, very, Sarah, a very excellent uh, presentation. We appreciate it. I want to also thank again everyone for, uh, for being on the line and joining us today. Uh, if there are no other questions, we will call this meeting adjourned, and everyone have a uh, pleasant afternoon. Thank you.